another edition of the Mindset Game Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. Before we get started with this week's show, first off, let me take this opportunity to welcome back the regular listeners, and if this is your first time listening to the show, I hope you enjoy this episode and decide to subscribe to the show. And on today's show, I've got Lance Walker. Lance is currently the Global Director of Performance at Michael Johnson's Performance in McKinney, Texas. Furthermore, Lance earned a bachelor's degree in kinesiology from Kansas State University, where he was a three-year letterman and attained academic all big honors as a receiver on the football team. He also earned a bachelor's degree in physical therapy and a master's degree in exercise physiology from the University of Oklahoma. So welcome onto the show, Lance. Thanks, James. So before we delve into today's topic, Lance, can you talk to me um, about how you want going to like what wanted to do exercise phys- physiology first of all, and and then maybe talk to into why you kind of did the other degrees as well? Sure, I I, I think um, probably like a lot of listeners uh, with their careers, they they have. Uh, they experienced something as a as a kid or as in my case as a high schooler that kind of turned you on to an entire profession that you didn't really need to know existed and and it started for me in high school as an athlete where I got injured uh, I had to go to a this sports medicine specialist and that sports medicine specialist sent me to a physical therapist and I didn't really even know anything about physical therapy that would have been in the early 80s and thought wow that's a pretty cool profession that they're going to help me get back to my sport which I love so much um, and it, and it kind of flips and switches to me that that might be something uh, of interest to me as a, as a profession forward. And so um, in high school, I said, you know what, someday I'm going to be a physical therapist. And, and that, that started my sort of my, my, my plot, of course, uh, in university. I went on to, um, to actually be a competitive athlete uh, at, at major university. Spent a lot of time injured there as well. So I got a lot of time in front of physical therapists. Um, and I started that, uh, that started the process of thinking, you know, why am I always injured? And this is kind of this kind of stuff. So what do I need to do to, to not spend so much time with these people that are really good at their jobs, but, but I, I really shouldn't need them, really. I should, I should be able to stay injury-free. Um, and so that, that kind of stimulated some interest in me to, to learn more about physiology. And, and um, I was already doing that sort of work to prepare for physical therapy school. And... Um, so it made a lot of sense to study a little harder on those those elements, and and ultimately I didn't get into PT school. You know, I didn't have the grade. James, of me going to graduate school because I couldn't get into physical therapy school my first time out, and uh, got a job as a strength conditioning professional in uh, in as a graduate assistant at Oklahoma. And in conjunction with that graduate assistantship in Oklahoma, I was also a research coordinator for the Health and Exercise Science Laboratory under the direction of Dr. Michael Bemben. And what that afforded me was two, twofold. One, it, it allowed me to continue my study. It allowed me to get into research, uh, researching uh, uh, a lot of the things of uh, trappings of what I'd studied as an undergraduate. But more specifically, it allowed me to stay connected with athletes uh, as, a, as a graduate assistant strength conditioning coach. And so I was sort of doing three things. I was preparing to be a physio. Hopefully that dream wasn't going to die. I uh, was learning a lot about physiology behind exercise and, and, and injury prevention and performance enhancement. And then at the same time, I was also getting my hands dirty. Instead of an athlete now, um, I was actually working with athletes in the strength conditioning world as a coach. And that went on for the better part of three years. And at that point, I was, I was able to, to finish my thesis, uh, became a published researcher, which I, you know, I thought that was pretty cool, uh, became an assistant coach. And then got the opportunity to also go to physical therapy school. So uh, it all kind of came together at that point. Then I had another decision to make. Am I going to go off and be a coach? Am I going to go off and be a researcher or a, a get into academics? Uh, or am I going to follow my, my, my childhood dream to be a physical therapist? And, and by that point in time, James, I knew I, I didn't want to be a physical therapist. I knew that that wasn't necessarily my, my end game, that I wanted to, to potentially leverage what I had learned in those, in those years up to that to avoid having to go to a physical therapist in the first place. Um, and then a, a mentor of mine, Dr. Dr. Anderson at the University of, of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, uh, he, he's, he's a physio, but he has a, a very interesting mind. And his mind was like, look, 
you could you could utilize what you learn in physical therapy school as a physical therapist to be a better version of whatever it is you want to become whether that's a physical therapist or whatever it is they call me now i don't even know i don't even know what that is james i don't know what they call people like me um but he really recommended to me that i go to physical therapy school that i that i fulfill that 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 dream of mine and it was a it was a godsend because it again it added that that third piece of that puzzle the coaching puzzle the the physiology the research uh, puzzle and then there's that there's that clinical piece of what happens when things do break down and I went ahead and went through with that continued coaching as I went to PT school um, continued to do research as I went to PT school for some reason uh, didn't sleep a lot for those three years but ended up coming out now with with three different degrees, three different very diverse yet interconnected experiences from both the practical and the academic side of, of the equation. And at that point then it was it was time to leverage that and to find ways to to leverage those three things for what I love. And and I love sports. I love I love athletes. I, I I'm enamored with athletes and what that's about and what that can do for a person's life, not just uh competitive life in sport but but uh, transcending other aspects of life and and that's what the better part of the last 20 years has been about is leveraging those three things to the betterment of athletes and that's pretty much what brought me ultimately from my path from the sports medicine side and the strength conditioning side at the collegiate level passing through some high school level strength conditioning and sports medicine passing back up to the NFL with some some uh some work that I did with the Dallas Cowboys for a few seasons um, and now back here at, at Michael Johnson Performance, which is um, is, a, is in the private sector, obviously, where I'm truly in this role for the first time able to leverage all of those expertise uh, to the betterment of the athletes that we service here. And now as a global director and executive vice president or whatever they call me now, my role now is more to leverage that in the betterment of the coaches and the systems that we use uh, to apply to the athletes versus the day-to-day -day coaching of the athletes, which I do very little of now. Uh, I'm able to touch much more of those athletes internationally as well as locally by working through my coaches and my therapists and my administrators here uh, sort of behind the scenes and leveraging those backgrounds uh, for best practices uh, here at MJP. So that's a long-winded way of taking you through my why I got here, how I got here, and and hopefully gives you some some context as to the, the approach that I take with, with what I'm doing here. And Lance, also we touched upon earlier in the episode that you were free le uh, free sport letterman. What were the other two sports you did at, at undergraduate level then? Well, it, it, in my high school, um, I was one of the athletes in a, in a high school that was so small that you, you had to play all three sports uh, or you didn't have enough to field a team. And um, we only had three sports. <laughs> so we had, uh, well, we had, we had four sports. I grew up in a farm community and you had four sports. And the, the fall sport was football, was American football, uh, which I ended up getting the, the, the chance to play at the collegiate level in. The second sport or the winter sport was basketball, uh, of which I had the opportunity to play collegiately and had a few offers, believe it or not, to play collegiate basketball. And then the third sport was track and field. The fourth sport was was hauling hay and baling hay, <laughs> building fences. It was the, the work of the ranch in the summertime. So that was sort of a sport, and that was kind of my strength conditioning uh, background in high school. We didn't have strength conditioning, proper strength conditioning in high school, and so we spent our summers uh, doing manual labor on the farm. So it was hauling hay, bucking bales, driving fence posts, um, that sort of thing. So that was my off-season was spent on the farm. And I was a three-sport letterman uh, in, in those sports in high school. When I went off to college, I had to sort of select into one, and, and there was no way I was fast enough to run track. There was no way I was, uh, I was good enough in basketball to play basketball. And I ended up at a college, a university, at the Kansas State University at the time playing football. It was the worst Division I college football program in the United States at that point. So it was my lowest entry point <laughs> to get in to play collegiate sports. And, uh, and luckily, uh, I was part of, of probably the biggest turnaround in college football sports history uh, because that, that program went from the worst in Division I history to uh, ultimately winning uh, championships in their conference and vying for a national championship at one point. Um, not when I was there, but it was, it was part of a, 
it was part of a resurgence or not even a resurgence, just a complete build of a program uh, that I was a part of. And, and that sort of, I think I leveraged my background there as a coach and as a builder of programs. I, I learned a ton being a part of that build out of, of really from the basement to where it is now. And, and so that's, uh, yeah, three-sport letterman in high school, certainly certainly not a three-sport letterman in college. That, there's very few of those, I think. Well, when, when you said, obviously, Kansas State was – a low point when you went there. That, that, it's surprising for me to hear that because I'd associate it with being a very good, good program. Maybe not so much at the moment, but obviously you talk about maybe at least a decade ago it was a lot better than it is now. So it's surprising you say you say it was the lowest of the low, but it's a program that come from somewhere. It was low. It was so low, James, that. They, have, they were talking about doing away with the football program at Kansas State when we got there. Um, the, the coach that, that, I, that I was recruited to, to walk on for, and that I was a walk-on. I was not a scholarship athlete initially. I was granted the scholarship, um, was, uh, was Bill Snyder, who's still there. Um, other coaches that were there were Bob Stoops was there, who was just recently retired head coach of the University of Oklahoma, and several others that have come out of that that uh, that regime have had head coaching jobs but we were so bad I tell the story we were so bad I was on I was a walk-on I was I was on the scout team obviously my first year uh, but I was also the number two wide receiver my first year so I was not only playing the scout team but I was also the number two receiver if somebody went down so we had so little of numbers that I would actually have to go back and forth from servicing the scout team to run a number twos uh, with the varsity team and back and forth and just depended on the day it ended up where where I would end up and so I think that was uh, that that taught me a lot of, uh, in, a, in a really short amount of time but it was also fortuitous for me because I, I probably wouldn't have been able to stick at any other program in the in the country I was just I was very very marginal athletically and, and as I said I was also very injury prone and ended up with I think four different surgeries uh, during my time at Kansas State because I really was not prepared physically uh, for the demands of, of college football coming out of high school. And it, I don't think it was any fault of a high school coach or, or my own. It was ignorance. I didn't know what to do. We didn't have access to it. Uh, but certainly that's something, the learning that, that I have is, is giving back to the youth athletes that we work so much with here at MJP of helping them realize their full potential for whatever that next step may be. And we've got a ton of athletes that leave us and go on to the college ranks. And we're really, really proud to be a part of their sort of their long-term development approach so that they do show up day one and they're ready to go, that they're, they're less injury risk there and that they get more out of their experience uh, in college. And it's certainly something I wish I could have rewound the clocks uh, to do for my own athletic career. But I think missing out on that in my high school years there's a reason I, I went through all those surgeries. There's a reason I went through all that, that turmoil because it's, it's given me so much more context now to what I do day to day in, in relating to these athletes, healthy or otherwise, whatever age. It's really been a, it's been a blessing, and I'm very fortunate, I think, to go through all that, all that stuff that I went through in, in college uh, to prepare for what I'm doing now. But would you say, looking back on it, would you say it was uh, maybe a lack of knowledge towards, well, Obviously, the, there's a greater knowledge in terms of prehab and all that stuff nowadays. Do you think if you had that knowledge back then, hypothetically, you might have not got the injuries? It's possible. I, I think the, the the saving grace for me, and it's something that's really a hot button now, I think, is is long-term athlete development. We had that at our school because we didn't have any choice. I mean, we had to be a multi-sport athlete from from a very young age all the way until we graduated high school. We didn't have a choice. Um, we liked all those sports. We loved a certain sport, but we had to play them all to, to support each other. And then add on to that the manual labor of growing up on a farm and, and having to go, you know, having to get up and chop ice in the in the winter time before school or having to, to haul hay in the heat of the summer. That was my only strength conditioning that got me prepared for football. So without that, I think I've, I probably wouldn't have had any success in high school football uh, because I didn't have the toughening or the, the strengthening that I got from just some of the manual labor stuff. That, and it sounds like I was in a, a labor camp. It wasn't, it wasn't like I was you know, like that bad. I mean, I'm making it sound pretty bad. But, 
but it's certainly not something that most of our kids are doing now. They're not playing multiple sports. And let's face it, there's, there's not a lot of manual labor going on out there. There's not even a lot of free play going on out there. So I, I do think that, uh, that although it probably gave me my best chance uh, to realize my potential in high school uh, and, and ultimately set the stage for college, to your point, it, was, it wasn't even ignorance. We didn't have a weight room in high school. I mean, we, nobody lifted, I mean, I say nobody, very few people lifted weights in high school in those days. Um, and it was, it was kind of a, it was a weird kind of a subculture too. The one or two kids that in my high school of, I think there was 125 kids in my whole high school. I think there was two kids that ever lifted weights and they did it in their garage and they were the weird kids. You know, they were, they didn't even play sports. They just lifted weights to, to lift weights. It was really a weird kind of a deal for us. So um, part of that's being in the, in, in, in the country, I guess, a little bit too. But I, to your point, if I would have just been exposed to lifting weights properly, I mean, just, I mean, just the basics of lifting weights properly, I think I would have been in better, better position to be injury free, not prehab, not any of that other stuff. But I, I really think that learning about being stronger, I, that would have been hard stop right there. That would have probably got me, uh, got me through my first year of college football. Um, in a, in a more injury risk-free, I guess, uh, uh, way. And that's just lifting weights. I mean, think about how simple that is. Just basic lifting we didn't do. And I didn't lift a weight. I didn't know how to lift a weight till my freshman year in college. I mean, think about that now. These kids that we have in Texas, I've got nine-year-olds that are lifting weights in their schools right now. So they're getting, and they're getting, I've got 12-year-olds that are doing prehab as part of their soccer uh, training. I mean, I've got, it's unbelievable the nutrition and all these all these things that have been pulled south to those ages now that we didn't we didn't even know about or have access to to know how to do them uh, at those ages. So certainly it's it's uh, it's something that's uh, I look back and again I go wow what if? Um, but I'm so glad I didn't. I'm so glad I didn't have that because it gives me great context as to what you can do with the right things at those younger ages. I think you touched upon a good point there, Lance. In terms of obviously nowadays kids are becoming. I won't say one dimensional, but obviously one sport centric. Do you think they are kind of limiting themselves a little bit in terms of their athletic development because they're not being able to do multiple sports like it was the case with yourself? Yeah, well, I mean, look, it's, it's the old thing you read on the internet, you look at Twitter, all the sage wisdom people are saying that sports specialization is bad and it's, it's causing plateaus in development. And James, we've been saying that for the better part of 20 years and it's done nothing but get worse. So yeah, I think, I think our kids, my son's 10, uh, I'm going to make sure he plays some multiple sports as long as I possibly can, but he's already 10 and I'm having to make a decision as a parent whether or not he's going to be able to play two sports at 10. I'm having to make it, and some of it's a financial decision. Some of it's a time constraint decision. Um, but I'm already having to make those decisions now for my own son. I know deep down it would be better for him, athletic development-wise, to play multiple sports. However, the reality of the systems here in the United States, anyway, preclude you from really doing it that way anymore. And I, and I say that with, with, um, with a positive feeling, too, that, that maybe there's a way for us to, to allow a kid to specialize in what sport that they love earlier and earlier, to fill that sports specialization sort of fever that, is, that has happened here in the United States. Yet we still, I think, have to go in and backfill what they're not getting from not playing other sports, such as the basketball, if my son decides soccer and he's, he's global football is big for him. So he's American football is out. It's global football, but it's global football all the time, James. I mean, it's, it's all the time. And he, he's got a knack for it. He's got an ability there. So he's already in a club team. And what's the club team telling him? You got to play all year with us. And I get that. What am I going to do as a dad then to backfill in some of these things? I'm going to encourage him like heck to play basketball. So we'll see if basketball sticks. Maybe track. Maybe I can get him to involve himself in some track in the spring in addition to soccer, and that becomes a nice overlay. But at some point earlier than later, I'm going to have to start making some decisions um, along with him as to what are we going to specialize in earlier than we probably would have liked to. However, knowing what I know now and the ability for us to fill in sort of retrofit 
some of those long-term development things in with that sports specialization training, I think gives him potentially a better chance of realizing his full potential for soccer because I can be smart with it, right? I can be very tactical with my abilities to fill those things in as long as I'm smart with it, with that other stuff that he does. Um, because let's face it, he could go play basketball uh, and, and, and have a very bad experience in basketball. He could have, he could get poor coaching. He could get, uh, he could get injured. I mean, there's a million reasons why parents will say, no, nah, he's a soccer athlete. He's not going to play basketball or another sport for fear of some of those other things. So pretend, there's a potential there, James, that sports specialization may actually be the right way to go earlier. Tongue in cheek with some of this overlapping sort of development. So I'm, I've kind of shifted my thoughts away from, from shaking my finger at parents and kids that sports specialize and and saying, you know, hey, that specialization is bad. I've been doing that for 20 years, James, and it, it isn't helping anything. I, I need to move into a solutions-based approach to this. And you know what I may be finding out is, and we're seeing it with some of our kids here, with the right training approach, you may be able to do it better. You may be able to do it more efficiently and more effectively long-term, uh, with a, light, a right long-term approach anyway, to a specialized kid at age 10. I'm not going to sit here and tell your listeners I've got that figured out yet. But I think for us as practitioners, at least here, we've got to sit in that space now and figure out solutions to challenges instead of just wagging our finger and saying, no, 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 don't specialize. Because I'm telling you, James, just wagging our finger. It's like that village idiot that's pointing outside saying it's raining. Any, any idiot can tell you it's raining, James. Find an umbrella, you know, let's find an umbrella. And there's not enough of us, I think, in this space. I say that with respect. There's not enough of me. So to this point, that's been looking for an umbrella, uh, and I think that's kind of where we sit uh, now in long-term athlete development, it's, at least here at, the, at MJP, is finding the umbrellas to those the solutions around sports specialization because it's happening whether we whether we wave our finger at it or not. Could could one way about obviously not stigmatizing the sports specialization? Wouldn't it be an essence of utilizing maybe a case of. Uh, other drills from other sports and incorporating into into that into your training. That's how I would probably go about it. Good idea. I think I think some people are doing that. Uh, I can tell you a guy that did it for years was Arsene Wenger at uh, at Arsenal. I mean, one one of the first meetings he ever had, I had with him. We had the the the, the luck of of servicing their academy uh, early on before Des Ryan came in and has really taken that thing. It's an unbelievable uh, academy approach that they've got now. Um, but initially we had some, some interlace with that academy development program and Arson sat in one of my meetings. I was talking about long-term athlete development and he, he came wandering into the meeting room and I was like, Oh gosh, you know, there's the gaffer walking in, you know, to my, my meeting, I'm here talking to your physios and your strength staff. And this guy sits down and he spends an hour and a half listening to me. This is in season. I'm like, Holy cow. Not only does he sit in there and listen when I'm done with the lecture, he comes up on stage with me, and we have a Q&A with his staff about long-term athlete development. He pulls out pictures, black and white pictures, of the facilities that Arsenal was using when he first started there. And he showed me one specific picture, and it was a picture of some basketball goals. And I said, what, what do you got basketball goals for, Coach? And he said, we used to have our young lads play basketball in the offseason and even pre-warm-up for, for practices. We'd have them play, play some basketball. And he said, you know, these are things that the kids these days are getting away from. And he said, there's, you know, he was one of them that said, look, this specialization is happening earlier and earlier. These 16-year-olds are professionals now. They're pulled out of their mom's and dad's houses, away from their chaps. And all they're doing is playing soccer. And he says, I understand it. But he said, I think we're missing some of this, some of this stuff from basketball. And that was the example he gave was basketball. But I've heard that from other, from other coaches as well. Um, and you're right. They, they, want, they want some of the trappings of those that athleticism from basketball or that athleticism maybe from American football. Sir Alex Ferguson, I met with Sir Alex, uh, with Michael and I in Doha in uh, 2008. And he said, and I couldn't understand a word he was saying, right? So, but, but anyway, and for, I, to be honest, I didn't even know who he was. I mean, I'm going to be real, I'm going to be straight with you. I didn't know who the man was. I knew he was in soccer. Um, I didn't even realize in 2008 how big soccer was globally. But Michael introduces us. He says, look, this is the guy, this is the manager of Man United. 
uh, at the time the biggest sports brand in the in the world and i think it's it's worth our time to, to expose to him what it is that we do and see if there may be some synergy and, and sure enough this guy basically says in that meeting that he's got some central defenders that he would like to have some of the athleticism of the tight ends and wide receivers of american football players okay and he said i've got some midfielders that i'd like to have some some suddenness and some turnability and mobility wise that some of your American football running backs have. I mean, this guy is supposed to, he's supposed to know more about soccer than anybody on the planet, right? And he spends most of lunch talking about the similarities of athleticism that he'd like to bring over from other sports and sort of, if he could just, just stack into the technical tactical abilities of these, of some of these athletes. And it was amazing to me. It was a, I, was like, I hadn't even heard of that because all I had heard about from soccer was it's got to be with the ball. If it's not with the ball, it's not soccer training. And this guy ends up sending us three guys in the first year. He sends us three athletes, uh, certainly with Tony Stredwick's blessings and, and everybody else that was like, hey, we're going to send three guys there for the off season, just to see how much that sort of stuff you could, you could stack into them if it was just more sport agnostic. It was just more it – came, it came out of sort of a raw ingredients approach. To stacking some of those ingredients in and I asked Sir Alex Ferguson at the table I said coach I said that that would be unbelievable even if we just got three or four weeks with these athletes but I know soccer and I know enough to know that you're a soccer coach and you need to tell me how much how much ball work do we need to do because I'm, I know I know soccer guys if it's not with the ball it's not training and he looked at me James this is the truth he said I want you to flatten all your soccer balls he said, in fact, I don't even want you to let them watch a soccer match on TV while they're there. And I said, you know, I said, what? He said, no. He said, that's the problem. He said, that's the problem. I want this to be a raw ingredients trip where they're focusing on the raw ingredients of athleticism that they may be lacking for soccer. Technical, tactical, they, they, are, they have capitated their potential in that area. And if they continue to kind of – even when they're there, continue to gravitate back to those strengths of what they're already really good at. I'm afraid they won't. They will lose focus on on potentialize. You know, looking at the areas of opportunity that they could level up on. And that was Sir Alex Ferguson in 2000, whatever 2008. That that instantly told me that I'm in the right space when I'm talking about raw ingredients of athleticism. There's more similarities than there are differences when you look at the raw ingredients, and you don't have the blinders on that I'm a I'm a soccer coach or I'm a football coach, or I'm a, and we see that every day, James. We've got Major League Baseball players out here training right now that when our NFL guys or our NBA guys are here with them, those guys would almost rather train together than separate. They're starting to see it. They're starting to see that, hey, I can steal some stuff from you. I've got professional bull riders in here that are stealing athleticism from the Major League Baseball players. I would have never thought about that. But those guys are sharing, they're swapping out secrets. They're swapping out it becomes a, a for us a space that I play well in and I know, I know my lane and I'm going to stay in it. I don't know soccer. I don't know professional bull riding. I know the, the raw ingredients for those things. And I can be very, very good at that. Let them, let them, let them bake the cake. Let me just sit in the place where I can help them generate the best raw ingredients. And then them and their tactical, technical coaches can bake the cake because I'm not, I'm not great at baking cakes. Okay. I am great at making sure that the, the supermarket is, is flush with great ingredients for them to use when they do bake. Well, it's coming back to that, that underlying issue, really. It's, it's trying to get the base as big as possible. So if you can steal elements from multitude of sports, it's going to be the greater, uh, greater resources of for the athlete in the long run because you've got more tools to utilize. I think so. It's, I think it's well said. And, and the athletes, it's not the sexy thing to say right now. If they want, it's, it's not sports specific. It's not going to help us. I'm, I'm convinced, too, that there is no, there's no such thing as sports specific training except for the game, it's the actual game itself. Anything short of the game itself is probably just sport relevant at best. And I'm talking about practice. I'm talking about drills. And I'm talking about everything we're probably just stepping into the sport relevant. And, and people say that may be semantics. You know, it, it, I, I don't think it is. I think it's the, the danger for us on my side anyway, and this is the way we look at it here, is that the minute we step into that zone of trying to be too much 
sports specific, I think we overstep our boundaries and we, t- we probably end up getting in the athlete's way a little bit. So we, we know our lane, we get in that lane and we run our butts off in that lane. Um, and, and it seems to sit pretty well with the athletes that, that frequent MJP. And I think if I utilize myself as an example as well, I've happened, well, you could say it from both sides of the coin, good or bad. I've competed at multiple sports, but I've kind of utilized those tools along the way. And I think it's helped me once I've gone into the fitness industry as a personal trainer, I've utilized all those tools, be it from an athlete perspective, but also learning from uh, the multitude of strength and conditioning coaches and then implementing it uh, into, say, the client's programs. Not wholly specifically, because obviously you can't do that because that's regurgitating somebody's work, but it's looking at it probably, and also my disability as well, looking at where people's weaknesses are, and I can probably see them a little bit quicker because, like, like you can attest to an elite sport, you don't have time to hang around to find these, these solutions. You've got to find them quickly. So a lot of it will be people are struggling with balance. Okay, let's work on, let's work on that because that will help in a multitude of, of things from, from just that one one exercise. Yeah, it's well said. And I think you touched on something. You touched on assessment. I think that's something that we, we know we know enough to know that we need to assess our athletes here because our, our eyes will fool us. You know, our, our background will fool us. We'll end up doing what we like, what we see. Uh, we let the data be the voice of the athlete. And that's something that Nike has taught us with our relationship with Nike is listen to the voice of the athlete. Some of that they're talking. You got to listen to that too, but you also got to listen to the data. And then you got to be able to sort of transform that data into, into meaningful, actionable things. And, and man, if we just come in and we have a, a methodology, we, I got my methodology from, from track and field. You know, if I say if I'm Michael Johnson's trainer, for instance, I'm, it's track and field. We're going to use a track and field methodology. Man, I'm going to tell you right now, track and field methodology doesn't work for every athlete. What we do is we steal. And we all steal, James. You steal. Every coach that's listening to this steals stuff. And that's okay. We're all a bunch of hacks, right? We're all borrowing from each other. Uh, but, man, I've borrowed so much from speed dynamics to, to speed endurance to uh, unbelievable things from Coach Clyde Hart, who was Michael's longtime coach. And I've applied those learnings. Not exactly. I haven't taken Clyde Hart's How to Train a 400-Meter Runner and applied it to my wide receivers in the NFL. But I can tell you this, there's four or five keys, keys to speed endurance that I've pulled out of that and now been able to apply to an NFL-based training program. The wide receiver, he don't know that it came from <laughs> Clyde Hart. He doesn't know it came from track and field. He thinks it, it's baked. It looks like something I need. That's a raw ingredient. I need to do what I need to do. He don't, need, he don't even know that I stole, I stole that, that concept from track and field. And because you can sit in that raw ingredients space, all of a sudden the world is your oyster, man. I tell you what, you can you can now steal, borrow, whatever pieces and bits from everybody. That's having a system, James. It sounds like you have a system. You don't have a method. And I think young coaches, I had a I had a method. It was going to be this. I came out of American football. This is the method that worked there. It's going to work for golf, tennis, track. That's the method. And that's the old golden hammer thing, right? If all you have as a carpenter is a hammer, every job you go on to, everything starts looking like a nail. Now, that hammer might work pretty good for a while, but you're going to come across things that aren't nails, right? And, and I promise you, when we hang on to that golden hammer, that that's the only thing that we, that we know, maybe it's strength. Boy, strength, that's going to cure all my ills, right? So every problem I see is a strength problem. Oh, they don't jump very good. Strength problem. They don't run very good. Strength problem. They have pain in their knees. Strength problem. No, no, no. I, I've learned the hard way. It, there are no golden hammers. And you as, a, as, a, as, a, as an able-bodied construction, I mean, you're going to go in there and be able to, you want to be able to go in there and do everything. You want to build that house. you got to have a toolbox with some tools in it that you are good at using, that you are a craftsman, that you're an artisan in your usability of it. And so us as coaches, we just keep adding tools to the toolbox, but also we know how to use each of those tools 
We also know when and where to use each of those tools. And it doesn't get in our toolbox unless we're an artisan, a craftsman, by using those tools. And our, our athletes deserve that. And that's, that sits us in a great position where we can have a professional bull rider come in, a major league baseball player come in, and a figure skater come in. They all came in today to get better at MJP. And if you don't have a toolkit, well, that makes it, it makes you have to go back to grabbing that one hammer. And that one hammer will, it, it won't even get you 50% there 50% of the time in most cases when you're working with multitudes of athletes across multiple ages at multiple sports. It just, it's just not best practice. And our athletes deserve better, I think. I think, it's, I think it also comes back to Lance. It's listening to the person as well because oh, it's no point when I had this argument with a client not really long, but by a discussion, I think it was last week, in terms of, uh, he said he kind of had a strop. It's like, no, you're not having a strop. You don't like what I've prescribed to you, so I will listen to what the argument is. Uh, and I think we resolved it. It was because it was something new and he doesn't like change. So I was like, I don't mind you whining. It's not, to me, it wouldn't be whining. It's <laughs> you have a problem with it. Let's discuss it. And say, well, okay, if you're not happy with an exercise, there's no point in me giving it to you if you're not happy doing it because you're not going to do it. So I'm quite happy to to go about and change it, and it gets but you better results. So it's it's a two way street. Okay, that they might. It's I think it was just because it was new, and it was difficult that that was the problem. Okay, I will listen to you and say, well, okay, what is what is the underlying issue? If it's not too great a problem, which it wasn't, we've resolved it. But if it, if it was that bad, you were risk getting hurt. Yeah, I've got no problem changing it. Maybe I was pushing the boundaries maybe a little bit too much. No, I think that's great. That, that You just said it, listening listening to your athletes, James. I, that's, as a young coach, I, I, I was the smartest guy in the room, and I, and I, I didn't listen to them. I, I pretended I listened, but I really didn't listen. I didn't press in and listen. And as I get older and older, I found out, you know what? It's not a, for me, it's not a two-way street. It's all about the athlete all the time. I am a servant to them. I am in the service industry. And I've, if I know exactly what's right and I haven't listened to the athlete, I'm wrong. I'm absolutely wrong because I haven't listened to you as the athlete. Then if I listen to the athlete and what you just said was, yeah, they, they, they're not buying into it. They don't they change. It's whatever. You're right. You, you press perfectly. I've got to figure out a way not to, to tell this athlete that they're wrong and I'm right, but okay, tell me what you think. Tell me what, what do you think we should do? What are your, what do you think your weaknesses are? What do you think you need to work on? And being able to then sort of come back and package what it is that you're coming back with to meet their needs where they are. That takes a lot of humility. Uh, and it, it takes your, you have to check the ego at the door. And as long as you're going to do any, do any harm, right. You're going to, you're probably going to have to adjust and, and more things to make sure that this athlete feels like they've got ownership of this. So normally Lance, what I do to wrap up the episode is ask this question. If you had to summarize our episode into, and put it into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? Um, uh, I'm, I hope that the message I think that I I tried to convey was was um, uh, and the gray in my beard will convey that your your the path of the, that you take in your life and and it's it ends up being the right path really I think it's it's um, it's an old saying an old baseball coach here Yogi Berra used to say when you come to a fork in the road you take it. I mean that that's kind of a you think about that and you're like well he didn't say anything you know yeah you're on that path for a reason. And I truly believe that now looking back and even looking forward that the path I'm on, the path that I've taken, uh, there's learnings from each of those, each of those things that happen good and bad. Every athlete that I've seen, I've learned from every coach. Uh, I've learned something from you today, James. I I've really learned that there's genius in everybody. There's genius in every single person you come across in our, in our profession uh, for sure. And I'd say most professions, but, but that pathway, you're going to come across people and situations and learnings and opportunities uh, that you can learn from, that you're going to grow from, um, and that's going to help you to ultimately, and this is the, the, end, of the, the, the end of the thing is, is, is it's to help you help others. And we, 
we are in a service industry. I'm, I'm a servant. Um, and, and I want to, I want to perpetuate that in my coaches that we are here for the athletes that we train and that we're actually paying it forward. We're, we're actually paying this profession forward. Some of these athletes may turn out to be coaches. I mean, you're an athlete that turns out now you're a coach. I mean, think about that. We are, we are planting the seeds for, for future coaching. And I truly have great pride and, 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 uh, and also humility balance there that, that we need better coaches. We need to be better coaches whether we're personal trainers, whether we're head coaches in, in the English Premier League, we all need to be better coaches for our athletes. They deserve that. They deserve the best from us. And I think we, it starts with us being the best version of ourselves for them. And we shouldn't expect them to be the best versions of themselves if we as a coach aren't expecting that same thing from, from us and our profession. And, and I think that plants it forward. It, it helps our athletes in the now. It helps our athletes in the future. And it, and it helps coaching, I think, ultimately in the future to grow. And, and that's coaching athletes, people just trying to, to lose weight or be healthy, uh, or even coaching other coaches, which is what I do now. So long-winded way of saying, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a path to that, that, sort of, that sort of capstone of your career, ultimately, where you can look back and how many people have I helped? Uh, how many people have I helped? And it's a great profession because we can help, the more, we can help them by helping ourselves along the way. Uh, by becoming the best version of ourselves. So that would be the, the, the way I would, I would encapsulate what we talked about today. And as I said, I'm talking to myself here. I can see my, my picture up here as I'm talking. I'm actually lecturing to myself. Everything that I just said, I'm, I'm looking myself square in the eye because I don't have it figured out. This path is still going. I sucked today on several things that tomorrow my athletes deserve me to be better at. And so uh, I don't want anybody listening to this podcast think I'm preaching. You know what I am preaching? I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to myself because I'm looking at myself in the mirror right now. I've got to be better for my athletes tomorrow than I was today. That's my remit to myself. And I would say that that's hopefully the remit that people get from this podcast is just like your athletes, come back tomorrow better than you were uh, today. So Lance, once again, thanks for coming on the Mindset Game podcast. Thank you, James. This is a great opportunity. I appreciate you. Oh, it's my pleasure. And before I forget, I would really appreciate it if you would be so kind as to leave a short written review as it helps to get the podcast more notoriety and it will be more visible in the future to others and thus helping more people, which my guests and I are all about. Once again, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you next time for another episode of the Mindset Game Podcast.